Chapter 7 Wayne of Beaujou and His Return to the People Wayne of Beaujou carefully put the Opogon pipe that his father had given him into the Gashkibi Dagon, Bandoiler bag, made many winters ago by his grandmother. He looked at his father with admiration and respect. He felt love and respect return to him from his father's eyes. Father, on behalf of those who will come behind me, Miigwitch for this pipe. I will carry it well. With that, Wayne Bujou turned to the east. He knew that the power of Ikandasawin, knowledge, flowed from the east, but he understood that the paths of knowledge led in all directions. He began his journey back to his people with a single step. He walked with a feeling of fulfillment that he had never known before. He felt whole. He felt at one with the harmony of creation. He saw harmony in all that was around him, in the hills, in the streams, in the birds, and in the four-leggeds. Wayne and Bougieu found himself returning to a familiar territory. He sensed that the forest of the giant trees lay just ahead. As he walked in the huge forest, he knew that the Bugwejimini must be watching him. It was a reassuring feeling, indeed, that his oldest brother was always there. Wayne Bujou began to descend from the mountains. The prairies and plains ahead did not seem threatening to him anymore. Each step seemed to be a greeting to Mother Earth. He was proud of the tracks he was leaving behind him. They were moccasin tracks. He knew that the creator, Gichi Manitou, would see his moccasin tracks just as he did the tracks of the great bear in the north. He sensed that the people of tomorrow would also see his tracks. As he journeyed out onto the prairie, Nudin, the wind, began to blow into his face. A small whirlwind raced around just in front of him. His feet gave way to his desire to run. He found himself racing across the prairie, trying to catch the whirlwind. The whirlwind was actually laughing at him. No matter how hard he ran, the whirlwind could always stay in front of him. The whirlwind would dodge this way and that. As they were racing across the prairie, the whirlwind called out to Wayne Bujou. My name is Baby Me Sesi. Catch me if you can. I am brother to Giji Basson, Tornado. I am brother to the water spout of the oceans and seas. Their power is my power and my power is theirs. My brothers choose to destroy and thus demonstrate the awesome powers of the Creator. I love to tease instead. You can find me in all places and in all seasons. I think I love the swirling snow the best. Wayne Bujou was annoyed at Baby Mimise, and he shouted as he ran, Tell me, brother, what purpose does your foolish life of teasing contribute to the creation? Baby Mise si replied in a laughing voice, My life may be foolish, Wayne Bujou, but I have a purpose in life as noble as you. My purpose is to tease those who take themselves too seriously. I tease the human beings, I tease the buffalo and all the four-leggeds, and I tease the spirits too. There is a place for foolishness in the creation. You better watch yourself or you will see me often. Remember, there is a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to live, and a time to die. Wayne and continued to question baby me, Ceci, as they ran across the prairie. What are you, brother, spirit or wind? Baby Misesi replied, I am wind, but I am spirit also. The creator has placed spirits everywhere. There are spirits in the rocks. There are spirits in the water. All of us spirits are an extension of Gichi Manitou. All of us must answer to him. Greet us with tobacco and we will tell you the secrets of the creation. Wayne Bujou tried in vain to catch Baby Misesi. Just when he thought he had the whirlwind trapped against a rock, the dust would settle and Baby Misesi would be gone only to re- reappear at another spot. Finally, Wayne Bujou had to give up chasing Baby Misesi. The whirlwind disappeared in the distance. His laughter gradually mingled with the sound of the wind. Wayne Bujou had to rest for a while, but soon he was again on his way to return to his people in the east. As he continued traveling, he thought of the words of Baby Misesi. He greeted the spirits that lived in the landscape here and there. He thought of blending foolishness and seriousness in his life. He thought of the power of the tornado, brother to the laughing Baby Misesi. 
Wayne and Bujou now realized that life was truly a balance between joy and sorrow. Times to be carefree and times to be careful. It was the purpose of baby Misesi to provide that balance. It would be his spirit that would creep into ceremony and make a person laugh at the most serious moments. Even ceremonies can get too powerful and need the balance that baby Misesi can provide. It would be baby Misesi also who would step in and keep us from taking our search for fulfillment in life too seriously. If we try too hard to make the right decisions in life, we might miss important signs that could lead us to the proper fork in life's path. Wayne and Buju recognized that there was a fine line between joy and sorrow, laughter and crying. Maui, crying, could accompany joy as well as sorrow. Tears come with the highest form of joy. Just when sorrow seems overwhelming, bapiwag, laughter, will come to provide the needed balance. Even as the death of a close friend, baby Misesi comes to remind us of the good times we shared with our friend. He makes us laugh in the midst of sorrow. Baby Misesi is the bringer of laughter and the tears of joy. The higher and rockier mountains that Wayne Abuju crossed long before in his westward trip loomed up in the distance. He wondered if he would see Misabe Mukwa this time. Just as he was pondering the power of the tornado, the earth began to shake. Wayne Abuju was alarmed because he had never felt this kind of sensation before. He reached for his tobacco and placed them on the earth. The earth continued to shake. Wayne Abuju thought to himself, After all the things that I have done, what is it yet that I have not seen or done? The earth shook more and more, and the fear of Wayne Abuju grew. He remembered his encounter with Misabe Mukwa and what he had learned about fear. Wayne Abuju pledged not to let Winanimiziwin, terror, creep into his mind. He struggled to gain control over his fear and not to panic. As Wayne Abuju looked into the distance, he could hardly believe his eyes. A huge rocky mountain was slowly coming apart. Rocks tumbled this way and that as the shaking continued. Finally, it appeared as though the earth opened up and swallowed the mountain. Nothing remained except the dust. The rumbling of the earth gradually diminished. A strange quietness became, began to cover the land. Wayne Abuju thought over all he had seen. He knew that there must be lessons contained in the Gushkese, Aki, earthquake. He realized that even the earth, as generous and gentle as she is, could also be destructive. He thought of the words of the Bugwe Jinini about how the creation should remain the same and how natural world should never be changed, diverted, or disturbed. He knew now that the power to change the creation should lie only in the hands of Mother Earth and the Creator. Wayne Buju realized too that no matter how much he could experience and learn in life, that there would always be more learning and new experiences ahead. He knew now that the road to knowledge is eternal. Wayne Buju continued on his journey to the east, full of wonder and awe at the power of creation that lay all around him. The wind, the sun, the lightning, and the thunder. Wayne Buju crossed the mountains and put down Asema, tobacco, as he crossed Misabe Mukwa's territory. As he traveled, he began to recognize more and more of the land. He came to the banks of the Ogima Kezibi. She was now swollen with torrents of water. She too lived in balance between peace and destruction. Wayne Buju thought to himself, these must be the purifying waters of spring. He placed tobacco in the swirling water, and tobacco led him to a safe place to cross the river. Wayne Buju also gave his respects to the Michizibi further ahead in the east. He came to the land of great lakes and forests that he knew to be the future home of the Anishinaabe. With each step, he sensed he was getting closer and closer to the settlements of his people. One night, as Wayne Buju made camp by the stream, he noticed Asiban, a raccoon, sitting on the bank of the water. The raccoon was gathering clams from the sand near the stream's edge. The raccoon would open the shell of each clam and carefully wash the meat in the water. In this way, Asiban would clean his food before he ate it. Wayne Buju watched the raccoon for a long time. When the raccoon had eaten his fill, he proceeded to wash himself all over. There seemed to be a lesson in the way that the Asiban prepared his food and cleaned himself. Wayne Buju realized that the raccoon was telling him that the body is special and sacred. We should be careful to put only clean things in our body because the body is what houses the spirit. 
The spirit is an extension of the creator and the body is its sacred lodge. It is our responsibility and ours alone to keep our body clean and pure. In this way, we can make a good home for our spirit. Reina Bijou resolved that he would start to take better care of his body. After all, his body was really the only thing he possessed in the world. He knew that the creator would notice if he made his body to be a clean and sacred place for his spirit. Reina Bijou pledged that from now on, when he burned tobacco and talked with the creator, he would braid his hair and dress his body in his most special clothes. He knew the creator could look through material things and see the true condition of his spirit, but he wanted to make a statement of pride about his body, the sacred lodge of his spirit. As he rested in camp that night, Reina Bijou looked up into the sky and was overwhelmed at the beauty of the Anung Ung stars. They seemed to stretch away forever in the Ishbiming universe. He became lost in the vast expanse of stars. His grandmother Nokomis had told him that all the stars represented the thoughts of the Creator sent out when he was looking for a place to put life. The knowledge of the Creator must be without end. If we were to seek that knowledge, we would have to know every star. Wayne Abuju sensed a pulse, a rhythm to the universe of stars. He felt his own ode, heart, beating within him. The beat of his heart and the beat of the universe were the same. Wayne Bujou gazed into the stars with joy. He drifted off to sleep, listening to his heart and comforted by the feeling of oneness with the rhythm of the universe. The next morning, he woke to the singing of the birds. The birds were returning from their winter home in the south. They were returning with the seeds of life just as they did when the earth was first created. They were reenacting their original instructions. Wayne Bujou looked around him and was surprised to see red berries growing here and there on the ground. He recognized them as Ode Minnong, heart berries or strawberries, that Nokomis once told him about. It was said that they actually resembled the human heart in shape, structure, and color. Just as the Ode Min was connected to the strawberry plant by a vast system of leaves, runners, and roots, so was the heart connected to all the organs and parts of the human body. The heart was at the center of the human body. Nokomis had told him that the Ode Min was the last to bloom and the first to ripen of all the berries. The Ode Min Nung became ripe just after the birds had returned from the south. Later, the Anishinaabe would hold their spring ceremonies with the ripening of the Ode Min Nung. Nokomis had told him that the Ode Min was a strong medicine plant. It could grow near the snow at the tops of mountains as well as in the low valleys. The roots of the Ode Min could be taken just before it became ripe and eaten to purify a person's blood. Wayne Bujou realized that in order for the work of medicines to be complete, healing had to take place not only in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense as well. The body and mind had to be treated together because they represented the duality of all things. The Ode Min was certainly evidence of this harmony that exists within the heartbeat of creation. Wayne Bujou put down tobacco and ate a breakfast of strawberries. With the sun rising into the sky in front of him, he continued on his journey. The sun seemed to him to be the center of this part of the universe. He sensed that the fire of the sun was at the center of all things. He understood that this fire was at the Niwei center of his own body in a symbolic way and also in a real way. The fire of the sun was at the heart of the most basic element of life. It was this fire that gave him life and kept him alive. As Wayne de Bijou walked on, he resolved to heed the advice of the whirlwind, Baby Misesi. He would make his life among the Anishinaabe to be a blend between wisdom and foolishness. He would make them laugh at his mistakes. Perhaps they could learn from his foolishness, but he would make them listen attentively to all the teachings that had been given to him. He remembered the pipe in his bandoiler bag and the instructions of his father. He knew that it was up to him to carry this pipe with honor until it was needed by the Anishinaabe. His heart became lighter as he approached the land of the Anishinaabe. The relatives of his four sons, he could see the smoke from their campfires curling up in the skies in the distance. He remembered a Nagamun song his grandmother used to sing when traveling and sounded his voice softly with those of the birds. Wayne Bijou began walking carefully through the land. It is true that he felt a special reverence for the earth, but also he wanted his arrival in the land of his people to be a surprise. Just then, the Didins, the blue jay, came to rest in the tree ahead of Wayne Bujou. 
Stevens started yelling as loud as he could. Wayne and Bijou pleaded with the Blue Jay to be quiet and even tried chasing him away, but the Deedens only flew a little bit ahead, yelling louder all the time. Wayne and Bijou sighed helplessly. If this kept up, everyone throughout all the land would know that he was coming. Today, the Ojibwe regard the Blue Jay as a gossip and a tattletale. It is true that he offers an alarm when a stranger approaches, but it seems that Deedens gets a little carried away sometimes. Human beings can act like the Blue Jay. Usually in every village or town, there's at least one person known as the town gossip. At times, the Ojibwe jokingly refer to this person as Deedens. Just then, Wayne Bijou was startled to hear a greeting called out from a short distance ahead. His presence was discovered. He was approached by a group of men. Their right hands were raised in the air with the palms facing in a gesture of friendship. Wayne Bijou raised his hand to return the greeting. One of the men stepped forward and extended his right hand to Wayne Bijou. Wayne Bijou accepted the handshake and placed his left hand on his brother's shoulder. His brother, in turn, placed his own left hand on Wayne Bujou's shoulder and greeted him with much joy. Wayne Bujou, he said. Each of the men exchanged greetings with Wayne Bujou in the same way. They said his name as they clasped his hand and shoulder. It was already just as his father had said it would be. Wayne Bujou felt a happiness, warmth, and fulfillment that he had never experienced before as he was led to join his people.